Welcome to Australian Hunger, I am your host Ben. On today's show I've got an interview with Amin Dead Birds Laughing, Ben Boyle, who I actually have talked to before in another iteration of my interviewing life. I talked to him on I talked to him about the 2016 release of The Parsi's Shunyata, another project he's involved in, which he mentions at the end of the interview. But uh, before we get to that There was a study out from Macquarie University about death metal. Yes, I think there must be some guy there who does studies about heavy metal or something, because I think I've seen something come out of there before. But um, it was a small study featuring 70 participants, so I don't know how much you can actually take from it. But it's interesting, and I think it kind of points to a valid issue. 32 fans of death metal, 48 non-fans of death metal, were played classic bloodbath song, Eaton and Pharrell Williams' single Happy. Um, their responses to violent imagery were analysed, and surprise, surprise, they're just like the rest of us. So, each participant was played Happy or Eaton through headphones while they were shown a pair of images, one to each eye. One image showed a violent scene, such as someone being attacked in a street. The other showed something innocuous, a group of people walking down that same street, for example. If fans of violent music were desensitised to violence which is what a lot of parents groups, religious groups, and censorship boards are worried about, then they wouldn't show the same bias. But the fans show the very same bias towards processing these violent images as those who were not fans of this music. So, you know, surprise, surprise. But um, I think it's a good point because we're still... To a large extent, we're out of this. You know, this, this satanic panic, this horror, this video nasties era... But we still bear the remnants of that era. It wasn't that long ago. It was the 80s, the 90s. I don't know necessarily as much the 2000s, but it was not that long ago. So I think it's really good to emphasize the fact that real violence and stylized fictional violence are very, very different and have very, very different impacts on people and do not, are not the same thing, and not the same thing. Um, I should also note that I've interviewed Bloodbath. If you want to check out that interview, go back in the archives, and you can uh, have a little listen to what we talked about on the release of their latest album. But uh, me and Dead Birds Laughing, they actually released their last album, the one prior to the one just released now, in 2013. So it was a little while ago, and we get into the reason for that. So Ben mentions a little bit about how um, depression was impacting him during the writing and uh, recording of this album, and I'd like to just emphasize the fact that if you are experiences, feelings like that, there are lots of resources that you can uh, reach out to, resources like Lifeline, Beyond Blue, they have material, as well as um, 24-hour um, telephone services. I don't know how many people this is going out to, but like... You know, it's, it sort of struck me, you know, the, the the profound impact that, you know, these kind of things have on people's lives while talking to Ben. I, I thought it's always good to, to mention it. And just a warning that that's something that's going to come up in the interview if you're sensitive to that. A Million Dead Birds Laughing, their new album To The Ether was released in February. I played a couple of songs from it during the interview. First up, Black Hole Spirit, then Pink Smoke, Vacuum Rot. And finally, at the end, Phoenix Fire. This is Ben Boyle from A Million Dead Birds Laughing. I actually saw you, God, what was it, a week or two ago, uh, playing with Hadel Moore. Um, oh, yep. Yeah, uh, supporting Anana Thrak. Really, really great show. Um, talk a little bit about that and, uh, and your tour with, uh, in Europe. Uh, yeah, well, we're stoked um, to play with Anel Nathrak. I uh, absolutely love that band. They're absolutely insane. So, um, yeah, it was a great show to come back to um, from Europe, that's for sure. But, uh, yeah, we just spent uh, pretty much the whole month of February on the road with um, Psychroptic, Aversion's Crown, 
Holy World, another Australian band, and uh, Within Destruction from Slovenia. And that was our first ever tour in Europe, and um, it was amazing. It was exceeded all our expectations, and uh, all the shows went really well, and we were just stoked to share that experience with uh, all the dudes in Psychoptic and Aversions, and also Holy World as well. Like uh, To have so many Australian bands on the one bill was actually quite cool. It was very comfortable, I would say. A very good first experience for Europe anyway. Mm, no, no, that's, that's really, really, really cool. Um, to get to uh, me and Deadbirds laughing, um, talk a little bit about how the band started. I think it's been about 10 years now, hasn't it? Yeah, this year would be the 10-year um, sort of anniversary, I guess. Um, we've actually been throwing around the idea of trying to do something this year for that, but it's still early stages and we're all so busy. But um, yeah, uh, it actually just started out of uh, a band I was in sort of coming out of high school called Scalera, which was kind of a melodic death thing. And um, that band just did some local shows around Melbourne and stuff, but sort of fell apart. And uh, me and the drummer, which was Dean Turner at the time, uh, just decided to do something new. And uh, I basically decided to play guitar in AWL because I was doing vocals in Scalera. And we just decided to make something crazy and not put any boundaries on ourselves and just try and make something that was, uh, I don't know, sort of honest and captured what we uh, wanted to do, I guess. We wanted to basically write music that we wanted to hear, so it just came out that way. But uh, from there, we, um, I mean, we had a lot of friends in the scene at that time, and we picked up uh, Sean, who joined on bass, and uh, I've known him since I was like 16 or something, so that was easy. And uh, Adam, who I have also known since I was like probably 12 years old or something, um, he was hard to track down at the time, but uh, we eventually got in touch because he was someone I really wanted to work with because uh, I was big fans of the bands he was in previously, which were uh, The Implicate Order. And um, before that, there was a band called Druid, which uh, sort of was Implicate Order before they changed direction. And uh, he loved the material and was stoked, and that was pretty much it. Once he joined, we didn't stop. We just uh, kept writing. And I set a goal for myself to write a song for every letter of the alphabet. It was just kind of to set a goal for myself. And uh, those songs are what makes up the first two albums. So they're like the A and the BL alphabet, I guess you could say. Now, where did the name come from? This is something I've always been curious about, but I don't know if the information is out there. I don't, I don't know if you want to release that information, to be honest. Uh, well, it's there's not really a lot of information. Uh, I just came up with it. <laughs> um, I, it's hard to describe where it came from because there wasn't anything specific. It was just uh, something that came to me. I had like three or four demos written, and I knew I needed to needed a name. And um, I don't know, I loved the sort of the the imagery of a dead bird. It seemed really impactful to me. And uh, the music was so eccentric and almost comedic in a sense because it was so weird. And I don't know, it just all came together in my head, and that's basically the name I came up with. Now, Adam has his own theory that he worked into the lyrics and um, in the song Requiem. But, um, I mean, for me, it just kind of summed up how it sounded to me in my head. Basically, how those parts of my brain connected. That's the name that came out. Mm, interesting. I don't, yeah, I don't really know if that makes any sense, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, you know, it, it, I think it's as good as reason as other. Um, just sort of extrapolating from that, like, it's got a really cool acronym, I think, possibly one of the best acronyms. Except for maybe some of the, the kind of classic hardcore punk bands, AMDBL. Was that something? Yeah, it just rolls off the tongue, sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. A- absolutely. Was that something that was sort of conscious? Did that arise later and you realized, hang on, we've got a really good acronym, which comes in handy when you've got a long band name? Well, it kind of happened hand in hand because as soon as I thought of the name, I started thinking about logos and the acronym was the logo, not the band name. So that was part of the decision as well because it was a strong sort of acronym. And I didn't expect people to have to say, I'm only dead birds laughing every time they wanted to 
say or refer to the band. So they, they kind of went hand in hand. Like one, it kind of solidified it for me. Like a movie diverse is pretty crazy. And I was like, it's pretty weird, but ADBL works really well. So they kind of worked. So you released three albums, 2011, 2012, 2013. Yep. Um, then you take a, a break, you release an EP with uh, a new song and some older material that you had some rattling around. Um, yep. And then three years later takes us to here. Now I want to, so that, that, that EP is interesting because it's actually a really cool because that material that you had on there um, from the past, but also the the reason you least released umbilical dystrophy on its own rather than mm. it sort of being retained for this album i i think that'll sort of set up a lot of what we're going to talk about so talk about that particular track umbilical dystrophy uh yeah so that was originally part of to the ether in the early stages but um it did work in with sort of the concept throughout the album that adam sort of had in his in his mind for the lyrics and everything uh but once we started demoing everything and he started laying down vocals it started to become apparent that it didn't really fit anywhere on the album because of how much how atmospheric everything else on the album was uh once we threw umbilical in anywhere it just felt like the entire album just changed and it was like a detour and then back to the vibe of the other songs so um yeah, because we kind of had the lineup change with um, Dan Preslin on drums and Adam rejoining the band, we just sort of decided that maybe we'll just use that song as sort of a little teaser of what the band is now before To The Aether, because To The Aether is quite different. So it was kind of a little precursor to how crazy things might be getting, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely a really good idea in that respect. So let, let's let's back up a little bit because I think that sort of sets up the idea of hey, what is to the ether? So yep. when do you start writing this new album? When do, does that sort of process start to begin? Uh, I mean, I was some of those songs date back to 2014, so uh, it's been a while. Uh, the first songs I wrote were "Black Hole Spirit" and uh, "Pink Smoke." Although at the time it was called The King in Yellow. Because um, originally, I mean, Adam wasn't back in the band yet. And things were kind of at a standstill uh, with the drama situation because Dean Turner um, couldn't continue with the band anymore. And Dan Preslin was sort of just filling in, but he wasn't sort of joining the band yet so uh i decided to just start writing um basically like it was at the start of the band i just decided to write without boundaries because i didn't really have a full band at that stage i just kind of started to write and see where it took me which took me to a lot of obviously different places to the previous album and um it was a very sort of intense uh personal time as well that I was going through and uh, which reflects a lot in how dark a lot of that um, material is. So it's it was a long time coming and it did take a long time to make the album work the way it does. It was sort of a drip feed and um, yeah, it came from a very different place to what the other albums did. So uh, anyone who's listened to the album, it's you know it it kind of contains like a core which is recognizable as amdbl but it it sort of uh, i don't know if you would say it sort of explores stuff you've explored before but like i think there's hints of ideas that are very much more fleshed out in this one talk a little bit about Mm. why that was kind of meaningful for you why that kind of fulfilled uh, fulfilled what you're working towards for this particular album uh well i mean in the past we have on the other albums had sort of soft uh sections or little interludes and things but never really tried to explore that i guess and um 
I wanted to, I just wanted to experiment with different sounds and sort of see where those ideas go rather than restrict them to you know because we're known for songs that never reach past the two minute mark basically and uh, normally um, it's all about uh, sort of connecting all those things in a weird way to make it as tight and concise as possible whereas on this one I kind of wanted it to feel like it was floating out into space a bit and sort of let those all those different elements breathe a bit more um, so that sort of was the mentality behind it and uh, I was very depressed through the writing process and so that helped uh, that's basically what created that sort of vibe that's on that album it's uh it's got some of the most craziest guitar work that I've ever attempted, but it's also got some of the most stripped back stuff that I've ever done too. It's, it was a very strange sort of combination of things that all came from a sort of a, I don't even know what the right word would be, <laughs> some sort of creative desperation, like a, um, it was like floating through a void, basically, which is kind of part of the concept of the album. So the, the ambience and things, you know, you're floating. You're not sure which way to go. And then there's sparks. And that's what I sort of wanted to try and create with the, with the album. sort of begin work and try and uh, write some material. Adam joins the band again. Does that have any effect on, I don't, I don't know about necessarily the direction, but like, does that have any effect on any of the material you're writing? Uh, no, I already had the whole album when Adam rejoined. So mm, um, when I started writing the album, Darren was still a part of things. But um, yeah, as I was writing it, I think... It became apparent to Darren that he didn't really know what to do with it because it was so strange because he's traditionally, you know, a very heavy um, death metal sort of vocalist and the stuff was very sprawling and eclectic and sort of very open. Uh, there wasn't as much sort of death metal riffing. It was more sort of, um, I don't know, even sort of blackish in a way, but sort of um, 
very sporadic. So he didn't feel confident with it, which was fine. And, um, you know, I still have that guy and he's still an incredible vocalist. But um, like I said, I was in a bad headspace through that time anyway. And I didn't really have a solid sort of lineup. There was no sort of regular band interaction at that time. It was everything was sort of in a transitional stage. But when Adam rejoined and, um, you know, Dan, once I, once I started writing the album, like Dan locked in that he definitely wanted to be a part of it. So once Adam joined, it sort of took shape and then the album made sense to me. So it was kind of like the last piece of the puzzle because Adam obviously is very strange vocalist and can do a lot of uh, very different sort of vibes and sounds and he's very melodic but can be very abrasive and, you know, very insane, crazy, you know. So all the ingredients of the album, instead of feeling like it was very... Um, instead of feeling like things were separate or not gelling quite as well as I'd hoped once Adam's vocals are there everything sort of feels like it's one thing and it worked so it was great mm-hmm. and, I'm, and yeah I'm like super stoked that Adam's back in the band because I, I was absolutely shattered when um you know, he had he basically had to take a break from being with the band after Zen, um, which is when we did Bloom with Darren. But uh, yeah, I'm like super happy to have him back because I think AMDBL sounds like AMDBL the most when obviously Adam's involved because he was there when the band began and a lot of his ideas um, just perfectly gelled with what we were trying to do. In terms of the vocals, the lyrics, um, talk a little bit how they developed. So, you know, you've got the the, the album basically written and then uh, Adam comes in and starts to fill that section of, you know, the, the, the greater whole. How, how does that all work out? Um, so it's kind of strange because, like, uh, Adam was starting to do stuff with a new band. And um, they were actually the process of recording an album. And for that album, he had written a story. And um, he already basically had a very sort of detailed, um, crazy journey thing that he was working on. And while they were recording that album, Adam left the band because they had a bunch of disagreements pretty much about that, about how he wanted to approach uh, the vocals and the uh, lyrics and things. And that's when he contacted me and um, Darren had just basically made it clear that he was going to move on. So the timing was actually very perfect the way that happened. And so straight away, I basically just told Adam to, um, well, I sent him obviously all the songs and everything and just told him that if he wants to, you know, come back and start doing stuff again. He's more than welcome. And so he took parts of that idea that he had and we spoke in a lot of detail sort of how, um, sort of how I wrote it and sort of the concepts that I had in my mind about, you know, the ambience and the chaos and how that worked together. And so he took that and adapted a concept that he sort of already had in mind that he's, he had been wanting to work on and um, applied that to to the ether. And it worked really well is that the, the album sort of is sort of a yin-yang sort of thing. So he's sort of used that in a way as sort of a feminine and a masculine sort of uh, duality on the album. So that's pretty much the theme and it's pretty much about that sort of um, that sort of dynamic, like yeah, whether it's in it's basically like a masculine and a female, 
like a masculine and a feminine dynamic. So whether it be, you know, your wife, your girlfriend, your mother, at least this is from my perspective because I'm a man, but, um, and how they can be a comforting, shining light in the times of darkness when you're most unsure. Like it's a, it's a primitive comforting thing. Like the, the, um, sort of a, a feminine presence. It's a, it's a comforting sort of powerful thing, especially for, um, you know, mothers and their children, if that makes sense. Mm. So that was, a, that was a bit of a ramble, but I was, I was trying to make it as clearly, like it's obviously not that simple, but that's, I was trying to make it as simple as I could. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 that's, that's, that's fair enough. They're, they're, they're very difficult to things to describe, even though, you know, it, it's funny because the words and theoretically you should be able to describe them the words, but like it doesn't really work out like that. Um, one, one thing I was really impressed with, with with the album, you know, with the sort of change of emphasis is how Adam sort of changed as well. Like, obviously you kind of have to do that, but like he, he, he was sort of, really gelled well with the album like what you were talking about just um the 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 ambient sections particularly just being able to put vocals on that i think it's generally quite impressive they they can they can be quite th- difficult things to kind of handle from a vocal perspective yeah yeah definitely and like um that that's the thing too like cuz when i sent it to him like i knew that it was a very strange um album but he didn't hesitate. I mean, he had the album written in a, I reckon it was about two and a half weeks. He had written the whole album, which is insane. Like he just nailed it. And he, and then he came in and did demos and he did all the demos in a matter of like four hours. And the album was there for us to listen to basically. So he just, I don't know, but that's how he is. I mean, he is, like a pure talent, like he, as a vocalist, there's, I don't think there's anyone else like that guy. I mean, he can just hear things and process them in such a different way. He doesn't really think like a vocalist. He, he thinks, um, very abstractly and, you know, he's, he's an artist, like, cause he obviously does a lot of art and draws and paints. So he sees it more than he thinks about it as, you know, uh, a normal vocalist would, you know, a normal vocalist might look for a chorus or a hook or um, think about a vocal style they're going to do. But for him, it's very natural. Like it just, it just works. And um, he also decided to go a bit more sparse on this stuff and make it more of, more complementary to the vibe of the album. Whereas like, um, you know, Zen and Force Fed are just very in your face all the time with not only musically but vocally. Whereas on this one, in the way that the album breathes more with the ambience and the chaos, Adam wanted to do that with the vocals too, which I think is, um, I don't know, I find it noticeable, but only because of the old stuff. But uh, it, it really helped the album flow really well. So we we have the you know the album basically in its sort of form. Talk a little bit about how, how we get there from there to the album being sort of in a releasable um, uh, form. Um, well, uh, I mean, once it was demoed, we sat on it for a while, um, and a lot of that just had to do with schedules. So, you know, Dan is in Navely Viscaris, so his touring schedule is quite quite busy and um he was also doing a lot of session work at the time so it was kind of um just sort of finding the right window to make it happen um basically what sort of transpired i mean that the album once it was demoed was done like the the order of the songs didn't change Adam's vocals, you know, he changed little things here and there, but they were essentially the same. And uh, all my guitars were the same as the demo. I didn't really, we didn't really change much after that. So everything was pretty much just there when we were ready to go to pull it all together. 
So uh, we used Troy McCosker, who uh, was working for Naval Viscaris, and um, we basically had a window because Dan was uh, recording his playthroughs for Naval Viscaris in Pony Studios, and Dan was confident that he could just smash out the album um, in a day uh, before he did the Naval Viscaris playthroughs in the studio. Uh, so basically we used his setup day, I guess you could say, and he just absolutely nailed everything in probably half a day or three quarters of a day. So that was really cool. And uh, he's put up all those videos online as well, I think. So you can check those out if you want to. But um, I mean, after that, we also sat on the drums for a while. Uh, it took me a while to do the guitars, like the final takes and everything, because um, I did them myself at home. So I was very, very hard on myself <laughs> and did a lot of takes. And um, as I was saying, I mean, I was working on this album through a very difficult time. And like from there, uh, after my guitars were done, and uh, because Dan was so busy and we didn't really know sort of – we didn't really have a timeline for it. And um, I had a lot of things going on, so it kind of went on the back burner for a little. And it was kind of on a back burner for so long after the guitars were done that it was sort of – hard to know how to bring it back or what to do because Sean who was playing bass also um, had just had a kid as well and um, you know the we weren't in contact as much and uh, basically Nick from Hadle Mall um, there was a window of opportunity to get the bass all done and the window was only two weeks. So normally on the other ANDBL albums, I write all the bass. Um, I write all the bass and I even help track it. So um, on some of the bass I'm playing, uh, you know, anywhere from 40 to 80% of the bass. Um, but that two-week window opened up with Troy to be able to get all the bass done and everything that, uh, I mean, I was not in a good place and there was no way that I could pull together all the bass and track it all in two weeks. But Nick from Hayden Moore stepped forward and basically said he could do it and he wrote and recorded all the bass in two weeks. And I love that guy so much. <laughs> but um, from there, uh, obviously, that sort of revamped things and so Adam tracked his vocals and everything. And uh, the album has been mixed for probably a year. I think we sat on it for like a year. It was quite a while. Because that's the thing with all our schedules. Like me and Nick obviously continued and were quite busy with Hadel Moore. And Dan obviously went back on tour with Neighbly Viscaris. So it was hard once again to find a window to make it happen. But uh, finally, we just said, fuck it. And so we just set a date, which was obviously last month, February 11th. And we just released the first single. And then we had to scramble to get everything together. <laughs> so we kind of put a... We kind of put, a, put a, uh, a deadline on ourselves, basically. <laughs>
so one thing about the album that uh, I think is actually the album in the EP really um, and it's like a minor thing but like when it's stylistic it kind of sticks out is the mm-hmm. use of you know multi-word song titles why, why did you decide to sort of um, kind of release yourself from the convention of using uh, single word song titles um, I think um, it just came from the different approach to the new album because um, once I knew sort of that it was going in such different directions um, I don't know it just felt right I, I tried to sort of because that's the thing the song titles were already set to um, Adam didn't change any song titles except for two I think I think it's two Yes, two, which was Pink Smoke, Vacuum Rot, um, and uh, what was the other one? Uh, oh, and Phoenix Fire. So that was his name for that song. It was originally called Mine Alone. So, um, yeah, I just tried to... Because uh, some, of, some of those songs I actually had the name first, like Martyrdom in the Fourth Dimension that was a song title that I had laying around for ages because I had some lyrics that I'd written with that song title. And um, I just got inspired and wrote the song for the lyrics I had, even though we didn't use my lyrics. But um, it was just something that um, sort of where I drew from, and so I used that title. And with the original... uh, two demos that I did, Black Hole Spirit and The King in Yellow, because the original idea was I was going to do an EP and every song was going to have a colour. Um, but that was back in 2014. And, uh, yeah, things drastically, obviously, changed from that initial idea. And um, once I started writing beyond that point, because uh, my life went through sort of a big transitional period that uh, changed how I saw those songs as well. So um, I guess the vibe of the album is so strong that the titles needed to match it, if that makes any sense. I know I keep saying that, but I'm just like rambling. (laughs) (laughs) No, 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 I'm listening attentively. (laughs) Do not fear. (laughs) Um, so speaking of kind of the titles, why did you choose the particular title for the album? Um, it being obviously as well the last track on the album. Yeah, so that song, um, that song was done when Adam came back. So those lyrics are my lyrics, and I sing on that song as well. And um, that song basically is sort of um, sort of a tribute to creating music and how I, the sort of uh, the place that I pull from to create. So it, it was fitting for the album, basically. I mean, that, that song came very late in the game and I originally just wrote it for myself and... Um, when Adam came back and I sent him all the songs I had and then I was all like, I also have, you know, this. And I also had Dim, um, which I sang on as well. And, uh, yeah, I, I left it up to Adam whether he thinks they should be on the album because I didn't want to force uh, my songs on it that I had done vocals for. That makes sense, but um, but no, Adam, Adam loved them, and he thought they fitted perfectly with the ideas he had for the lyrics and everything, and so it um, yeah, it just all came together just right, which things seem to always do with me and Adam, so it's great. But uh, yeah, I guess that's basically what the song is. It's a tribute to sort of not only musicians and, you know, how they have to dig deep to create, but 
also, you know, a lot of musicians um, are prone to, you know, mental illness and a lot of musicians um, out there tend to identify that as the part of them that helps them create music, especially dark music. Um, you know, some people can't seem to separate the two. Uh, and it's, it's sort of about that. It's about sort of exercising that part of yourself and sending it out into the world or into the universe, either way. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, that's a very, very good point. Um, so with the artwork, who did you get to do that and what was their brief for it? Uh, so the view from the coffin is an Italian artist. Um, I was just a huge fan of his stuff. And uh, because the album obviously was very different, we decided to go with a different sort of art style than we've had in the past. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I hit him up. He, uh, as far as the brief, I mean, I sent him some of the songs and some of the lyrics and sort of gave him a, gave him a rough sort of... Um, rough sort of description of what the core of the album was, which to me is a muse, um, which is the feminine. So that was basically what he tried to go with. He listened to the songs, he looked at the lyrics, he looked at my sort of brief description that I tried to sort of give him just the core of what the centerpiece of the album was, which was the pink smoke and the muse. And that's what he created. And we thought it was really cool. Mm, yeah, it definitely sort of captures that vibe. Um, so in addition to that, there was some interesting illustrations that I think you're using as uh, the, the band picture at the moment. Was, was that created by Adam? Yes, yeah. So the, the cover was created by View from the Coffin and uh, all the other artwork surrounding it was done by Adam. So um, Adam sort of did his own rendition of the, the yin-yang with the female and the male, uh, which is, you'll see is our sort of cover photo on the Facebook and you'll see it in the physical copy of the album. Um, basically, we're, we're including that as a poster and stuff, which has all the lyrics on it, which turned out really cool. And um, yeah, so he did that. And with the band photo, we uh, just took a photo of us and Adam took it and redrew it and added, you know, crazy stuff to it to basically fit this sort of uh, crazy story he has going. So, yeah, it turned out very different. I'm not sure if it can even be called a band photo, but it's really cool. <laughs> and that's pretty much why I like it. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. Um, I want to ask you some other questions about... Um uh some other things so uh, sure. as, as we've mentioned you're in some other bands um talk yep. a little bit about them and what, what, what's happening with them at the moment um so yeah i'm also in obviously hadel more um we're just started writing again for the next album um and just came off the european tour so that's pretty much what we're focusing on for now. We will be doing some more touring this year, uh, but that's still all sort of um, coming together. Nothing's locked in yet. So, um, yeah, I'm very excited about everything Adelmore's doing. And um, I'm looking forward to this new material because it's sounding very, uh, very evil and very crazy. So that's good. Uh, other than that, I mean, Papasi. Uh, I have written the second Vipassi album, so that's pretty much done uh, as far as the initial demos. Um, right now, Dan is um, writing his drum parts for it, and uh, you know things might change from there. We may restructure a few things here and there uh, based on ideas he has. Um, we also just got Aaron McSporin on bass from Verbum. Um, so he's also at the moment going through and writing all of his bass parts. 
Um, he's a very busy touring musician, but he's um, yeah focusing on uh, coming up with a lot of cool ideas for that. So really excited about that. And of course, Benji is uh, working on his leads. So my job at the moment is done for the second for Parsi album as far as writing. And so now I get to sort of sit back and wait and hear everything awesome that the other guys do. Sort of following up from, I think, a lot of, sort of stuff we've been talking about, um, like the lots of people doing lots of things and you know it, it this sort of creates kind of a little bit of i don't know difficulty is the right word but you know that they, they have to put it into the extra effort to kind of fit everything in what, yep. what makes it worth it rather than just being in um i don't know a, uh, a, a, rather than just being in hadel moore for example and that just being your thing what makes it worth it to do all these different other things as well um I mean, that's probably more a question for the other people that play on it because I, even if no one was there, I would still be writing these albums. So I sort of have an, uh, I sort of have to write. It's like therapy for me. I have to, I always hear things in my head and ideas and so I have to get them out in some way. So um, I'm always doing something. So I'm more, the reason it's worth it for me is like, I'm just so grateful that I have not only friends, but other amazing musicians that, uh, find my stuff, um, you know, inspiring to a degree that they want to be a part of it and that they find time in their busy schedules to contribute to it and become a part of it. So for me, that's, you know, I couldn't ask for anything more than that, you know, and like everyone that I work with inspires me, you know, immensely. So it's great. Well, one of the kind of, I guess, the threads that I feel runs through the, all the projects that you're involved with is there's a degree of, I don't know, complicatedness, even if it's not necessarily complicatedness in the very technical sense. Um, what is it that kind of fulfills you about that broad sort of category of music? Uh, well, I just think, um, you know, I think life is complicated and, you know, people are complicated. And, I mean, some some aspects I could, I can sort of describe as far as trying to capture, say, a feeling or something, which I say was more akin to sort of the ambient stuff you hear on To The Ether. That is sort of... Like, that was me working through that feeling. Like, you can, if you just focus on the ambient compositions, like, that is, there's sort of a recurring sort of motif throughout them, and that's sort of me working through something. As far as, like, the crazier sort of stuff that I tend to do, it's very hard to describe where that comes from. <laughs> it's like... uh it's just a part of my brain. Um, like I, I can just hear it and I pick up a guitar and I somehow am able to make it happen based on what I can imagine. It's just, um, you know, I, I never pick up a guitar to, uh, to write. It's always, that's always the second step. It's, it's sort of a reaction to the idea I already have or a riff I can already hear or, you know, a feeling I already want to convey. Like, it's already there in my head. I don't pick up a guitar and go, all right, I need to write um, an AMDBL song now, and I, you know, sit there and play with chords I like or, you know, just try and make something heavy. You know, that's that's never the goal for me. I um, I always try and make something that does have a deeper meaning, at least to me. And what sucks is I, it's very hard for me to describe that deeper meaning on some of it, <laughs> but, uh, it's, it's harder on some things, easier on others. Like I would say Vipassi is a lot more linear than ANTBL and Vipassi generally is more positive in a sense and more, um, there's more of a message 
and uh, sort of inspired thought in Vipassi. Vipassi is more of a sort of um, Vipassi is more of a sort of me trying to capture the parts of life that I find fascinating. Like uh, a lot of the theme of the first EP just had to do with those aspects of life or those aspects of history. It was it was kind of all encompassing. And um, the second album that I've written is, um, you know, it's it's all a fascination with light and like where uh, the world was once lightless except for stars. There was no light. And that's basically the headspace I put myself in to write the album and about that light and, you know, how important the sun was or the morning star or stars in general and how fire was, you know, such an immense step forward and also a very destructive step forward. So that was my headspace for the second album that I've written. And um, with NDBL, NDBL is pretty much you're, you're listening to my brain. I hope that makes sense, which it probably doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and like know. I mean, yeah, and Hadel Moore is like Hadel Moore is really collaborative. Like uh, me and Nick work really well together, and um, you know, I get ideas the same way I do sort of with A and B R with Hadel Moore. But um, you know, with Nick there, when he sends me an idea, it sparks an idea with me, and we we can just send stuff back and forth, and it's it works out really well because our styles really complement each other. But yeah, so that's how they all those three work. <laughs> when did you start playing guitar and why did you stick with it what was it that kind of resonated about it with you I mean I've I've loved music since I was very young um, you know my dad absolutely loves um, heavy music and hard rock and stuff and, you know I've heard all these vinyls since I was a baby so it's always sort of been a part of me and, uh, you know, my brother got me into things like, um, you know, uh, Pantera and stuff when I was like six or seven. And uh, Dimebag was a huge hero of mine because um, I could not work out how he did what he did or the sounds he did that he made. And, um, yeah, I'm not sure. It just occurred to me one day that, you know, I could try and make my own noises you know and try and make my own stuff and um yeah i decided to play guitar and um i started playing i, I was very athletic until that point until i was like 12 13 then i um picked up the guitar i did like traditional lessons for quite a while and um i've forgotten all of that stuff now <laughs> it's not a part of my brain process anymore but uh yeah, like it's – I think it's just uh, like even when I started playing guitar, after like six months in, I was already trying to write my own songs like with just what I had, the tools that I had at that point, you know, whichever chords I knew or scale that I had learned. Even though I couldn't play them perfect or that well, I was trying to create an order of chords that was just my order of chords and that sort of thing, you know, in – um it's always just grown from there because once I sort of unlocked that, I don't know, it's never stopped. I'm just always trying to create something that's um, distinctly me, I guess, the same way that when I heard Dimebag, it sounds like Dimebag. You know, like it's that distinctive character that, you know, a, a lot of great players have. Uh, one last question. What have you been listening to, reading, or watching lately? Um, oh, that's a good question. Um, I always get stumped with that question, put on the spot. <laughs> uh, I mean, recently, uh, I mean, I've been listening to the new Fallujah for the last few days because that just came out. And that was that's quite interesting. They've um, changed it up a bit. Uh, other than that, I've 
recently watched um, Lords of Chaos, which I thought was good. It was quite entertaining. Had a lot more comedy than I expected, but it kind of made sense to me that, you know, they were just crazy teenagers. So, of course, I were like that. Uh, the house that Jack built, which was very intense. Good old Lars von Trier. I don't know if you know much of him. And uh, Climax is the most recent film I just watched, which was Gaspar No and was also very intense. So, yeah, I tend to gravitate towards things that are intense, if you haven't noticed.
So she can sleep without the windows Keep her safe from dragon's tail Be her way So she can set this sea of dreams That was Phoenix Fire. Before that, we heard Pink Smoke Vacuum Rot. And the first track was Black Hole Spirit, all from A Million Dead Birds Laughing's new album, To The Ether. Thanks again to Ben Boyle for chatting to me. Before I go, I want to give you a recommendation for something possibly to listen to. Perth Band, One Person Band, Les Silhouettes. Uh, His album, The Comfort of a Grey Sky, it's kind of influenced by shoegaze, post-rock. There's some definite sections where black metal can become a little prominent. Uh, It's really sort of centred around these repetitive motifs and then kind of, it it sort of differs a little bit from your classic post-rock, which is kind of the whole piece moving and to and fro. Whereas this kind of, a lot of it has repetitive motifs which go for a while and sort of it's really built around those it contains a 30 minute song which is always an impressive achievement to make such a a long piece which is not absolute nonsense um this album came out in february but uh, he's also released a night of distance uh, just this month so if those kind of things take your fancy check out that um those two albums that have come out if you want to get in contact, have a comment, question, uh, if you're in a band and you possibly interested in an interview, hit me up on social media, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all at OzHunger, that's AUS Hunger, and you can also send me an email, AustralianHunger at gmail.com. Um, I feel I'm, I'm hitting a really good streak. Um, there, there was a number of interviews which I was trying to nail down. And I think I've got them. So quite a few in the next few days, and I hope to pump them out relatively quickly. But uh, it's something to look forward to. Until then, bye. Bye.